This is part two of my video cast to address keywords and phrases relating to diabetes. These are the keywords related to diabetes from multiple years of ITE reports. The phrases that are crossed out were addressed in part one. The phrase in red, diabetes and stiff joint syndrome, was a new item in 2017. The first issue is autonomic neuropathy. Autonomic neuropathy has a multitude of manifestations. It may be worthwhile to pause the presentation here to review this slide in greater detail. My discussion will focus primarily on the cardiovascular manifestations associated with autonomic neuropathy. Symptomatic autonomic neuropathy occurs in only about 5% of patients with diabetes. Resting tachycardia and loss of heart rate variability during sleep are some of the earliest signs. Both systolic and diastolic dysfunction are associated with autonomic neuropathy. Baroreceptor function is compromised in the presence of autonomic neuropathy. This occurs due to damaged vasoconstrictor fibers and ineffective cardiovascular reactivity. Orthostatic changes in blood pressure and heart rate are another indicator of cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy. Also, Failure of heart rate to respond to exercise is indicative of significant cardiac denervation and is probably associated with, in, with decreased exercise tolerance. Finally, autonomic neuropathy is associated with dysrhythmias that may be responsible for sudden death. Although they aren't cardiovascular manifestations, it's interesting to note that both oxygen and carbon dioxide response curves are altered in the presence of autonomic neuropathy. This may have ramifications in attempting to reestablish spontaneous ventilation at the end of a general anesthetic and postoperative respiratory depression, especially following the administration of opioids in the PACU or on the floor. Other than the central nervous system manifestations, hypoglycemia is probably most easily understood as a cause of an adrenergic syndrome. This slide correlates the manifestations of hypoglycemia with specific blood glucose levels. Again, it may be worthwhile pausing the presentation here to review the slide in more detail. Note that the values for blood glucose are in millimoles per liter. To convert that to milligrams per deciliter, multiply by 18. CNS manifestations of hypoglycemia include confusion fatigue, headache, somnolence, dementia, diplopia, visual loss, and convulsions or coma. Cardiovascular manifestations include tachycardia, palpitations, increased myocardial contractility, increased myocardial work, and vasodilation. Increased myocardial work may lead to ST segment depression. ECG manifestations include ventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, prolongation of the QT interval, corrected QT interval, flattened T waves, and ST segment depression. Hypoglycemia can also result in increased factor 7, platelet activation, and neutrophil activation. Increased oxygen consumption and diaphoresis are common manifestations of hypoglycemia. The next key phrase relates to glucagon and hypoglycemia. Severe hypoglycemia is defined as an episode that the patient cannot manage alone, that is, an episode where someone else needs to intervene. This graph shows that patients with type 1 diabetes average approximately one severe hypoglycemic episode per year. Although apparently less common, severe hypoglycemia is still a problem for patients with type 2 diabetes. This graph demonstrates the efficacy of both IM and IV glucagon in treating hypoglycemia. Note that the glucagon is administered at time zero. It is obviously effective very shortly after administration, whether given IM, IV, or sub-Q, so it's a reasonable approach for a patient with severe hypoglycemia who does not have vascular access. Recognize that glucagon has effects other than simply increasing the patient's blood glucose. 
A patient with coronary artery disease might not tolerate the increase in myocardial oxygen demand that occurs as a result of the increase in heart rate and contractility following glucagon administration. Although metformin is associated with the development of metabolic acidosis, this is generally associated with toxicity due to increased blood levels of the drug or concomitant administration of other specific agents. Metformin has had a resurgence in popularity based on a series of studies documenting its efficacy in reducing all-cause mortality, such as this one from 2010. The same effects were observed in patients with a history of heart failure or reduced creatinine clearance, factors that had been considered classic contraindications to metformin. Metformin, a biguanide, is associated with an increased risk of lactic acidosis. It decreases hepatic gluconeogenesis and increases utilization of glucose by skeletal muscle and fat. Hypoglycemia may occur, but not as frequently as with other classes of oral hypoglycemic agents. Note that it relies completely on renal clearance. As would be expected, renal failure is a significant risk factor for the development of toxicity, that is, for the development of lactic acidosis. Most experts consider that a creatinine clearance of less than 60 milliliters per minute constitutes a threshold for the increased risk of lactic acidosis. Other risk factors include severe heart failure, generally defined as an ejection fraction of less than 30%, the administration of iodinated contrast agents, which are no longer used to any degree, and other factors associated with compromised renal function, such as dehydration and fasting. Concurrent administration of medications such as ACE inhibitors, sartans, diuretics, and NSAIDs are also reported to increase the risk of toxicity. <clears throat> Some studies, such as this one from 2007 on patients undergoing cardiac surgery, demonstrated no difference in the incidence of metabolic acidosis in patients with type 2 diabetes receiving metformin less than 24 hours pre-op compared to patients receiving other oral hypoglycemic agents. The best predictor of postoperative renal function is preoperative renal function. That's as true for patients with diabetes as any other patient population. Diabetes accounts for over 40% of patients with renal failure. One thing to keep in mind is that the risk of severe hypoglycemia increases with decreasing renal function. This slide shows the natural history of renal disease in the presence of type 2 diabetes. In most patients, microalbuminuria is present at the time of diagnosis. Even with reasonable management, frank proteinuria and increasing serum creatinine levels are evident about 12 years after diagnosis. End-stage renal disease begins to appear about 15 years after diagnosis. Diabetic nephropathy is characterized by persistent albuminuria, usually defined as greater than 300 milligrams per day, that is present on at least two occasions separated by three to six months, progressive decline in glomerular filtration rate, and elevated blood pressure. It occurs with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and evidence suggests that effective treatment of diabetes delays or prevents the development of diabetic nephropathy. This slide shows the most prominent nephrotoxic agents and where they have their effect. For our purposes, the primary agents of concern are antibiotics, specifically aminoglycosides, vancomycin, and cephalosporins, iodinated radiocontrast agents, which, as stated previously, are rarely, if ever, used anymore, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Chemotherapeutic agents, especially cisplatinum, methotrexate, and nitrosureas, are not ones we administer, but have a significant impact on renal function. With the exception of methoxyflurane, which is no longer used, metabolism of volatile anesthetic agents to inorganic fluoride is not a problem with regard to renal function. In patients with diabetes, hypovolemia is a risk factor for the development of renal failure. Based on that, 
patients with diabetes undergoing any surgical procedure associated with significant blood loss, such as aortic surgery, trauma, or liver transplantation, are at increased risk for postoperative renal dysfunction. Essentially, no intraop interventions other than maintenance of normal volemia and avoidance of nephrotoxic agents reduce the risk. Another factor to consider, and that could easily be the subject of a question, is the management of oral hypoglycemic agents in patients with renal dysfunction. I apologize for this busy slide, but it does provide a cohesive summary. On the horizontal axis is glomerular filtration rate divided into ranges. On the vertical axis is a list of drugs or categories of drugs. For each drug, there is an area of GFR for which the drug is considered safe, indicated by the dark gray areas. Some drugs are not recommended at all below a certain GFR, as indicated by the lighter gray. As indicated by the bars with diagonal stripes, for some drugs there is a range of GFR over which they can be used with caution, but generally at a reduced dose. As indicated by bars filled with small circles, some drugs are considered absolutely contraindicated below a certain GFR. This graph can be slightly simplified by realizing that for most drugs, the point at which recommendations change is a GFR of approximately 50 milliliters per minute. Further restrictions occur at a GFR of approximately 30 milliliters per minute. These generalizations aren't precise, but they are probably close enough to be able to answer a question on the test. It is also potentially important to remember the dosing recommendations for only one drug do not change as renal function deteriorates. Diabetic peripheral neuropathy is present in 10 to 20 percent of patients with diabetes. It typically has an insidious onset and is worse at night. By definition, symptoms are primarily peripheral in distribution and they are most commonly symmetrical. Diabetic neuropathy is generally attributed to disease in the vessels supplying the nerves and affects both myelinated and demyelinated fibers. The diagnosis of diabetic peripheral neuropathy should be made based on the history and physical exam, specifically assessment of vibration, pinprick, touch, and proprioception. Motor nerve conduction studies may be abnormal in a small subset of patients with large fiber neuropathies, but are not recommended for diagnosis or follow-up in the majority of patients with diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Stiff joint syndrome is also termed diabetic scleroderma, chiroarthropathy, or diabetic stiff hands syndrome. It is described as being present in up to 40 to 50 percent of patients with type 1 diabetes, but may also be seen in patients with type 2 diabetes. The prevalence increases with the duration of the disease. Flexion contractures of the fingers may be present. Screening for stiff joint syndrome is done by looking for the prayer sign. Normally, as shown here, Subjects are able to press their palms together. Patients with stiff joint syndrome are unable to press their palms together, so a gap remains between the opposed fingers and palms. This is obviously an abnormal exam. The abnormality is described as being due to sclerosis of tendon sheaths and limited joint range of motion, in addition to the previously mentioned flexion contractures of fingers. Some improvement in joint mobility over time may be achieved with tight glycemic control. Another screening test is termed the palm print sign. Ink is applied to the hands of a patient who is then instructed to press his or her hands onto a piece of paper on a table. In grade one, all phalangeal areas are visible. In grade two, you cannot see the interphalangeal areas of the fourth and fifth fingers. In grade three, 
you cannot see the interphalangeal areas of the second to fifth fingers, and in grade four, only the fingertips are seen. Diabetic stiff joint syndrome is important because there is reported to be an association between that manifestation and difficult intubation. Up to one-third of patients with long-standing type 1 diabetes are reported to present some degree of difficulty on laryngoscopy. This is generally attributed to limited mo mobility, most commonly of small joints, due to deposition of glycosylated collagen in the joints. There is reported to be an association between difficult intubation and a positive prayer sign. Other factors predisposing to difficult intubation include limited atlanto-occipital joint mobility and something called scleroderma of diabetes, which constitutes woody, non-pitting edema of the posterior neck and upper back. In a single study of 60 patients with diabetes, the palm print sign was described as being 77% sensitive and 89% specific in predicting difficult intubation. None of the other tests evaluated, including the prayer sign, modified malampati exam, or measurement of thyroid mental distance, or assessment of neck extension, was as effective in predicting difficult intubation. This concludes part two of my podcast on diabetes. Good luck on the exams.